have already now. Um, the main code is over here. Um, there is a readme file which you can see and again in this file you can choose the problem. In this case I have chosen the problem 8. Let's go and see what is that problem. So you come to problem underscore inputs dot m, go to case 8. Um, the names are written of these uh, standard test problems which are available in the literature. So 8 seems to be ZDT2 with 30 variables um, and um, uh, no constraint, there are two objectives, we are using 200 generations with a population of size 60. Uh, then initialize between 0 to 1 each of them, crossover probability 0.9, mutation probability 1 over 30 and then um, the uh, eta c and eta m as I said for, for NSGA2 or any multi objective optimization you have to keep little large eta c. So, for single objective we use 2 to 5, here we use 10 to 20, sometimes we use 30 as well. Okay? So, just to show you what happens, uh, okay, if you go to evaluate, uh, this is where you describe the problem. So, you go to 8, case 8 and the problem description is right here, but uh, you can also find all these test problems in the literature. If you have to solve a new problem, you can come here and add the problem as another case and go and give the parameter, problem parameters in this file and go to NSGA2 and call that number here, that's it. Once you have done that, uh, then you run and if it is a two objective problem, uh, it should come up with some figures. But let me see what is happening here, yes. So, eventually it comes up, uh, uh, I just wanted to, okay, no problem. Um, so, this is how the ZDT2 front looks like. Um, it is a non-convex front starting from 1 here and 1 there. The distribution is, is not that great, uh, but if you run it again, you might get si something slightly different. Okay? But the essential idea is that they should all come and converge to the Pareto front eventually. So, there are many other such problems. Uh, if there are, if you, if you choose a three objective problem, I think at the end of this code, you can plot up to three dimensions. So, if the dimension is, if the number of objective is 3, it can also plot that. Okay? So, data 1, 2 and 3, these are the three objectives. It also creates some file, output files where you can um, go and see how these files look like. Uh, now, I have run this in a different place. Let me just go there. I um, think I learned this on this. Um, when you run it, it creates all these output file. So, there is a all underscore pop dot out, every population is saved. A final pop is the final population. Uh, this is the parameters used. Uh, best pop and final pop, there is a difference. Uh, one of them has only the objective values uh, and the other will have all the details and initial pop dot out is what was the initial population. So, you want to see where the initial population or the final population you can use final pop and initial pop and plot them and you can see how much it has moved. Okay? All the parameters of that you can change going to the problem inputs because all the parameters are here and there is no other parameter needed as I said. Population size, number of generation, number of objectives, that is not a parameter that comes with the problem. Constraint, again constraint you can add. Uh, we have some constraint functions I will show you. Uh, lower bound, upper bound, crossover probability, mutation probability, eta c, eta m and if you have any binary variable. So, it looks like this code can handle both binary and real okay? because somebody was asking me yesterday and I probably said no, but looks like it can do this. Um, evaluate dot m, I am trying to look for a constraint problem. So, OSY is a constraint problem. Okay? Uh, so, there are two objectives and so, when you say n of how many objectives, it knows that the first that many are objectives. Next um, few are the constraints. So, these are all constraints and they have to be put in greater than, these are, these are constraints from here onwards. So, n obj plus 1, n obj is 2. So, up to that is objective, beyond that is all constraint. So, you put them into greater than equal to form and normalize. Okay? All of them you put, that is all. It does automatically computes the constraint violation and constraint domination principle and everything it does. So, here there are lots of problems, there are about 25, 26 problems. So, you can uh, look at them how they are coded and you can run them 
at your spare time to see, but you need to also know what are the respective Pareto fronts. So my multi-objective book has uh, Pareto fronts of each of these problems. So you can refer to that or in the literature. Any question? I mean, it will be very quick today, little, little thing, everything. But uh, so this is how NSGA2 you can use. So let's now move to our slide number nine. I think we did almost uh, eight completely, OK? Um, now, I want to do few things from here. So let me just see how to start. I want to do the innovization first, OK? All right, so we need to move a little later. And I'll come back to some of these, yes, here, innovization. So uh, this is not a dictionary word yet. But uh, it's innovation through optimization. So it's a crossover between the two words. Okay. Uh, basically, we want to innovate, uh, and everybody wants to do that in an industry, right? Come up with new ideas. Come up with a, a new way of solving, which has a lot of intelligence in it, which probably people didn't know before. So if you think of now how people innovate, um, you look for books on innovation. There are very few articles or books you will find which talks about a systematic procedure of innovation. Uh, innovation seems to be a happenstance. That means it just happens. You are taking a shower, it's an idea comes to your mind. Or you are playing something, suddenly some ideas come to your mind. But I don't think you can have a, you know, a consistent and sustainable innovation process by happenstance. And it's also there is something that if you are an expert, then only you can innovate. Okay. Uh, I think at some point we can teach innovation. We can teach the ways to innovate, formal ways of doing it, systematic procedures of getting towards innovative solutions. These are possible. Uh, and I am, since I'm working in optimization, I've been always thinking through that route. Uh, when I was solving some industrial problems, we found that the Pareto optimal solutions have certain properties. Uh, initially, I thought those properties are some manifestations of our code, that our code is not able to a code is kind of artificially coming up with these properties. But then if I thought, when I thought deeper and deeper, we figured that no, uh, Pareto optimal solutions should have certain properties because all of them are optimal, right? Uh, so if you then come up with a procedure of knowing what the properties are, you can actually have a very systematic procedure of getting towards innovation and having new ideas. So let me just explain what I mean. Let's say we've got, we're all, all working in a, electric motor company. Every day, uh, there is a company, uh, there is someone asking us to design a motor with certain power requirement. Okay, so all we do is this power requirement is the only thing we have to know. And we go there, put that as a limit, and then come up with a compact motor, right? It, so if I'm optimizing, I will be minimizing the size of the motor with the restriction that the power should be at least so much, okay, whatever is asked to do. And then there are a lot of variables. What are the variables in a motoring? It would be the there is armature inside, the armature dia, the length of the armature, how many laminates I'm going to have. There is a wearing that is inside. What is the wear dia? How many turns I have to do? What is the insulation thickness? And so many different things. The connection, X, Y, Z. There are different kind of ways you could do. Uh, so all these becomes your variables. So once you choose one such value, you get a motor. And when you plug it in, the motor works, right? You get certain speed. Uh, now, you want to do it in a compact manner. So when you optimize, you are going to get all these parameters, all these variables, you will get an optimal value, right? For the size and, the, and with the constraint that the power is at least so much. So another way of doing it is I take the power out and call it as a objective function. So I'm going to minimize my size and also maximize my power. So I'm going in this direction and this direction. So what you will have is a solution as a Pareto set which looks like this, right? Where you will have a very small motor which minimizes the size, but the flip side is that it also minimizes the um, power, power delivered. Now, if you take this one, it maximizes the power delivered with all other constraints that we had. And obviously, it's going to be more bulky, right? So that's the trade-off. And you will get lots of other intermediate solutions. But for each power requirement, let's say for this particular power, you will have an optimal size. And that's our goal to find, right? 
if you do not do optimal size, all your power for this motor, uh, this power, the motors are going to be over here, they will be more, uh, more and more in size. So, this is the absolute minimum, this is the absolute minimum size, anything below is not possible. So, when you optimize like this, either we can use the generative method of the classical way of doing it. So, one by one we can generate or we can use a evolutionary method with the population concept. So, we find all of them in one run, does not matter what method you use. That is the first step that if I can optimize and find a Pareto optimal set. Okay? So, that means each one of them for the required power, it is the optimal size. Is that clear? Okay. Now, let me lay them in this order that going from small power to high power and I open the cover. So, I see all my variables over there. right? Now, let me ask you this question. Those of you in electrical engineering can answer it better than others is that if I look at all these like the armature size, I see the armature size is increasing here, right? Uh, there is a wearing wear dia a number of turns which I do not see, but when I open I can see that or when I have designed all the variables I can see, right? Do you think from here to here to here all these dimensions will be just randomly changing or there will be some kind of systematic way they will change? You expect a systematic change, why? That is because each one of them is a optimal solution and there are like Kuntakar conditions, there are optimality conditions for multi objective as well. Because of time we did not talk about that, but it is just a simple extension of the KKT for single to multi objective. So, each one of the solution has to satisfy all that conditions. So, when they have to satisfy all the conditions means there is certain common thread that is binding them there. If you satisfy those, then only you are there. Okay? So, when I look into the relationships of is there any relationship these variables have, I am going to discover those principles that will make them an optimal, that will satisfy the KKT conditions. Okay? So, that is an argument coming from the theory, but it is also kind of intuitive because these are optimal, so these are not any arbitrary solutions. If I give you 10 solutions from the search space arbitrarily for every power I give you one, another one I give you another, even though they can be non-dominated, but if I do not give you something close to the optimal. I may not expect any kind of relationship, right? So, if I randomly pick 10 design from the existing way they do, I may not see anything. But if they have done it in a nice manner, in an optimal manner, I will then observe some relationship. So, first thing is to get to the near to the optima and then you can expect some principle to happen. Now, think about if that principle is, if you discover that and if that is that's helpful to you, right? Because next time if you have to do a design, you actually know what properties your solution should have. So, lots of knowledge you can gain um, ab about your problem, which if you are just designing day in and day out every day, a new power requirement comes and you just design it. But some point you should stop and say, what have I learned in that process? I have been designing motors for the last 5 years, have you learned anything? If there is a new one comes, do I have enough knowledge to say a few things about it? These are very important. This stays with the company as a best practices laws uh, and can be just proprietary to the company and this might give you the leadership. So, we are just formalizing the whole process, but then when you go and find these solutions and the, what is kind of hidden in them, often you see that there is innovation, often you see that there are some new principles which are not known before. So, let me um, show you a few examples of what I mean. So, Actually, we eventually we eventually did a uh, motor design. We have taken the problem formulation from a thesis from Stanford actually, where there is a detailed description of um, the formulation of the problem is given. Uh, they have also formulated like an optimization problem, but they did a single objective optimization. So, we took all the information from there, except that we have two objectives now. One is the maximizing peak torque, another is minimizing the cost of producing that or fabricating it. Um, and then there are about 45 to 50 different variables that they considered. We said well that is too many, we just want to, we are not doing it for any industry, we just want to show this principle of innovation. So, we considered only 5 of those variables, others we have kept fixed. Okay? And then we run our NSGA2 and this is the Pareto front we get. Okay? Here is all other possible solutions. So, these are really optimum like the way I was showing in the previous slide. right? Now, each one of the circle here is a motor and I have 5 decision variables 
which is changing from here to there. Now innovation starts. Well, this is the first phase of finding it. Now the, the analysis part starts. And then we look at, if I line up all these solutions from increasing um, value of peak torque, okay, how these five variables are changing? That's the question we are asking, right? So for multi-objective optimization, when you get number of solutions, you will be choosing one for implementation, right? But then others you throw away. But I'm saying before you throw away, you look at them and see what kind of information is stored. And that is the task of innovation. So what we observe in this problem is that four out of five variables are exactly the same. All of them have the same value. One of them is there are two types of electrical connections that were considered, Y type and delta type. And Y was, Y turned out to be the same. And then later on, we looked into some electrical engineering handbook and uh, we found that they recommend for electric motors to have a Y type connections. Okay, so that matches with our result. Uh, there are three types of laminations they have used, three different shapes of the laminations. They arbitrarily gave names like X, Y, and Z. And it turns out that all of them has Y. Okay. Then the interesting thing was that there were number of turns which was a variable. How many turns of that wearing that you have to do inside? That's a very important parameter. Um, and a 10 to 80 turns were allowed in the optimization process. So this is the lower bound that's the upper bound on that variable and it's an integer. It turns out all of them has exactly 18 turns. What is the implication of that? So I'm talking about innovation, but I'm showing you some results. But now the innovation comes. Previously, for different motors, the company must be using sometimes 10 turns, sometimes 15 turns, sometimes 35 turns, all the way up to 80 turns. So they should have a general winding machine, general purpose winding machine, right? Where they can go and set up how many turns it needs, and the machine will do that much. Now with this, it says only 18 turns is optimal. If you do anything less or more, you are not optimal. Okay, this is of course with respect to all the other 45 variables that I kept fixed. If you change them, maybe this will change to something else. Okay, but this is for that I'm showing you here. So now this gives an innovative idea. Just this result gives an innovative idea to come up with a turning machine that will do exactly 18, not one less, not one more. That way what happens is you always have a good quality control. When you have a general purpose, you may miss one or two or add one or two more turns. But you can now ask some people to say, we want a turning machine which will do exactly 18. And you know that that's the optimal way of doing it. And you will always have a good quality. The fourth one we have was there are 16 gauges. So gauge means the diameter of the wear that are allowed in the optimization process. All of them seems to have gauge number 16. Okay. Now you see that's another innovation for the inventory. Previously, you had to keep all 16 of them in your inventory, and some of them will require this, some other motor will require that. But this analysis says no, 16 is the optimum. So your inventory becomes simple. Okay. So you suddenly do this study, and you go and tell your boss, I will, I will simplify the inventory just by having gauge 16. It'll, it'll have you to have less cost. You'll never run out of the material. So this, you know helps the company do this production in a much better way. So trimming off the variables, identifying uh, what is best for it can be all inventions that can come from this, which otherwise can be very difficult for you to know. Because all these things, if I give you the problem formulation, which was like two page long problem formulation, it will be very difficult for anyone to look at the formulation, do something to it, and come up with all these vital information. When you optimize, all your solutions get straightened, all your solutions gets behave in a way like an optimal solution should do, and they start to show some characters. They start to have some common properties in them. All you're trying to do in innovation is try to understand that common property from data, and then keep them as rules. Okay? So that's, that's the whole task. And I don't see any other way you can get such information other than this process that I just mentioned. So we took it and tried on many, many different engineering problems. This is a mechanical engineering or structural engineering design problem. Here is a plate. And I'm applying a load on, on this midpoint over here. It is supported over there. I want to know what should be the shape here. So that two things are optimized. One is the weight of the whole thing to be minimized. The other is anywhere there is a deflection. So we look at the maximum deflection anywhere in this plate. 
and we want to minimize that. So we want to make it stiff, and we want to make it with less weight. And that's always a conflict. If you make it with less weight, it's going to be so flimsy that it's going to deflect quite a bit. So then you have a large deflection. But if you make it with small deflection, it's going to be heavy. Right? So that's the trade-off. And you see we got nine uh, trade-off solutions. Okay? Uh, one with the small weight, but large deflection. One with a large weight, but small deflection. And there are some intermediate. Now, once I found that, then I want to look at these solutions and see, is there some common thread, common principle that they have? So let me show you all those results. Here are those nine, oh, is it nine? Eight solutions, sorry, eight solutions. So here is the minimum weight solution. Here is the load I'm applying. Here, everything here is a support. And so every grid here is our decision variable is one or a zero. So it's a, it's a Boolean, it's a binary string problem, binary coded GA we have used here. One means the material is there, zero means the material is not there. Okay? So this is what turns out to be the final design. You see, any engineer will say that if this is your support and here is a load, you just join it, right? And you go as much as high as possible because then you have the good grip, right? The good cantilever effect. Okay, only thing is you have to make sure your dimension here is good enough so it doesn't break. So it finds that. It's a minimum weight solution. But this one deflects like uh, like a lot, a lot of it deflects like a large amount. So the next solution in my Pareto front is this, where it says that, okay, these members are too long. And again, that's another engineering thing. When the two members are long, in order to make the structure stiff, what do we do? We join them. So here, these are not trusses. These are plate members. So we just join. So this comes like a thick member of joining the two. Now that you have done it, this kind of becomes like a hinge. So you can have a very small dimension over here, still like a cantilever. So this is again another innovation that if you want to make a good compromise between weight and stiffness, add a stiffener. This is called a stiffener. Add a stiffener. Okay? Join the long members with a stiffener. So these are many things to learn when you just do. One other common thing you observe is that, which I didn't put into the code, is there is a central symmetry. All of them has. Because the loading is symmetric, so you expect the symmetry to come. But this is so obvious that I'm not even saying it at the first time. Okay, then what happens is, when you try to go further trade off, this has to go away and this design has to come back. And then with a little thicker element, so this is a bit more stiff than this and that, but a bit more heavy. Then the next one, the stiffener comes in with little more heavy weight over here. And the stiffener seems to be gets thicker and thicker. And eventually, you have almost the whole plate. And that you can't beat as a, uh, as a good stiffening solution. Right? Notice one thing again. We don't have these corner materials. These are called chamfering. chamfering. Yeah, chamfering in, in engineering. That we actually chamfer the, the edges. You might think we do it because we don't want to have a sharp edge. I mean, that's one of the reason. But another reason is these members here do not contribute anything to the strength or to the stiffness. Okay? It unnecessarily adds to the weight. So the algorithm figures it out that these are not needed with respect to the two objective trade-off. And this is another innovation that comes in. So if engineering was not discovered, if you do this study, if optimization was discovered before engineering, we would have done this. And a lot of engineering skills we would have learned by this kind of process. So this is what I mean is that this has a lot of power because these solutions are not arbitrary solutions. These are optimal solutions. And once we find them and analyze them, what's happening, it can give us a lot of valuable information. Okay. Yeah. So each one of these is an innovation that I'm just mentioning here. Okay. Another problem for mechanical engineering: it's a gearbox. There are 28 gears. Their thicknesses are variables, and the module, which says how the geometry of the gear tooth looks like and also the number of gear teeth. So it's a mixed integer programming. Number of gear teeth is going to be an integer. Uh, the thickness can be a real number. And module, of course, we kept it a discrete at a span of 0.1 mm. Okay? Uh, we considered three objectives for this, but two would have been enough. But we did three. It turns out, so somebody was asking me, what if some of the two objectives are correlated? So here is one you can see. In three objectives, you expect a surface as a Pareto surface, right? But here we get a curve. That's because. The volume and the center distance. So volume of the whole thing we are minimizing. Center to center distance between the input shaft and the output shaft. 
the distance here is also minimized. That is related to volume, right. So, if you minimize volume, it so happens center distance also gets minimized. So, there is a correlation, but they have an opposing effect with power. So, the volume and center distance correlation gives me a, a, a curve instead of a surface. So, if you project this onto this place, you will see a trade off. If you project them into power and center distance on this frontal plane, you will see a trade off. But if you project this into volume and center distance, this plane over here, if you project everything, there is no, there is a correlation, there is no anti correlation, there is no trade off. Okay, this will be sort of like a 50, 45 degree line if you project this over there. So, which means they are they are correlated. So, it does not matter, you can still use an emo algorithm if there is no surface it is going to give you the curve ok. So, we get this curve. So, we also learn from this that these two are correlated we do not have to have uh, both of them as objectives. But then if you take all these gearboxes each circle is a gearbox with 29 variables some of them are integer some of them are discrete and some of them are real valued 101 nonlinear constraints. So, it is a real problem ok real problem. Um, I want to now know how each of these 29 variables are changing when you go from here to there. Okay. We notice that, so here I am showing you the thicknesses. Okay. Number of gear teeth is almost the same except one or two cases there is one or two varying. So, it is almost the same. Then I am seeing here how the gear thicknesses, the pairs of the gears which are this we are, ma we are mating, they have the same gear thickness, but so there are few pairs of gears here. I think there are eight pairs of gears. How are these gear thicknesses changing with the number of solutions, with the solutions? So, here are the solutions IDs and you see that they are more or less the same. They are not changing much. Okay? The only way the solutions are changing is by the module. You now see the module versus different power that we get from it and there is a nice monotonic relationship. When I fit a curve through this, I see this relationship module is proportional to the square root of power. It is a square root law it is following. Now, this was not known before, right. So, once I get this study, I see that the only way the solutions change is the module is proportionate to square root of power. This gives me a thumb rule. This gives me a, a, a rule that I can use as a best practice because I know if you do this, you are optimal. If you do not do, you are not optimal because these are properties of optimal solutions. So, the implication is this. If you are today designed a 4 kilowatt uh, a gearbox delivering 4 kilowatt of power. You have got all the information, gear thickness, the number of gear tooth, the module which is in this case about 0.2 uh, centimeter to 2 millimeter. So, all these are known to you. Now, tomorrow you get from somebody else to do a 16 kilowatt of power. You know it is going to be bigger because I need to deliver more power, all my gears have to be bigger. How much bigger? What do I have to change? Do I have to change the gear number of gear teeth, do I have to change the thickness of the gear or we have to change the module of the gear. This study says that if you set 16 by 4 is 4, take a square root of that 2. So, if you multiply the module by 2, you will be designing it in an automatic manner, okay, in an optimal manner as well. You do not have to change any other thing. Okay. So, this is the power that you have. So, if you multiply module by 2, what happens to the diameter of the gears? also gets multiplied by 2 because the diameter is proportional to module. That is, so when you multiply the diameters by 2, your gearbox gets also bigger. That is the optimal recipe of going from small gearboxes to large gearboxes. So, you can see that you can actually understand the recipe of how to change or, or move your solution, scale up or down your solutions uh, by this study. And these are valuable, vital information that designers are always interested in looking, right? So, what about the optimization of uh, elasticity of the gears? Well, that will give you another principle maybe. So, these are with these two objectives. If you change your objectives, change any of the constraints, some of these things may change. But that is what I say that if your gearboxes are designing every day, but different parameters, different dimensions, different numbers, uh, one day you should say stop. Let me just try to understand by this process of what goes on when I change parameters, when I scale it up, scale it down and this can give you very valuable information. So, then you decide for this class of problem what objectives I should have, what constraints I should have uh, and you know that then I am not going to change it when I am going from one small scale to large scale, then these properties are valid. Okay. 
Yes, yeah, yeah. Of course, I cannot take this to solve. I mean, as you said, if you add another objective, you may have a different things coming out. So, you need to first decide on that, that what are the objectives, what are the constraints for this class of problems you are interested. And then you do the study. If you change the problem, you may have different outcome. But that could be another thing, I, I name that process as a higher level innovation. So, you could do with one parameter setting, actually we did it for some material. So, let us say you do it for one type of material, you get some law. You change the material, same problem you are solving, you will get a slightly different law. So, there are different laws now as a function of material. And then you are trying to see what is common in these laws, in when these materials. So, then you come up with a higher level innovation principle. So, all those are laid out. Uh, but uh, it is best applied when your problem is fixed, only thing is some dimensions of that you are changing. Some, it is just to say that you are a company doing gearboxes every day, you are specialist there, you are designing gearboxes every day. It is just that somebody has this requirement, somebody has that requirement in the size, material and some of these things. You want to sit one day and decide what am I learning from this, what is to learn from this, so that next time somebody comes to me, I can very quickly come up with a solution or at least a starting solution or at least get insights about, for example, this gives us an insight of how to increase the dimension of the gear and then this can be beneficial in many different ways. Okay? Uh, so, uh, for that purposes, knowing any new principles which can lead to some innovations, so all these can lead to the innovation. If you are, if the product are coming, the, the designs tasks are coming and you are just delivering, just delivering and you do not have time to think of what you are doing, you have a procedure you are following and giving them the results, you are not learning anything, right. So, these are knowledge discovery, these are kind of uh, discovery of, of how to solve the problem we are talking about here. You are trying to unearth that from the multi objective optimization data. I do not think you can get such information from, from an arbitrary set, a lot of people do in industry for many years, uh, this is called platform design, where um, you, you, if you design this gearbox, you, you come up with a, with a portfolio of your designs, okay, and then you try to put some common thread. Let us say they will have all common screws, uh, certain things that are not readily available, you say those are going to be fixed, so that when you are scaling up your design, there are few key things that are fixed in all of them. So, this is called a platform design. This comes very close to what I am saying, but then they, are, they never care about optimization. None of them can be optimized. You just design something for this size, design something for that size and then replace something with some common thing that you want to have. But what I am saying is what is that common thing that these solutions should have if each one of them is an optimal solution. So, that is what you are talking about, right. Okay, I have lots of applications. Uh, let me not go into all of them, but let us take this idea out of engineering and show you something on other problems that we have done, at least one or two. So, you can see the general applicability of this principle. So, with a couple of undergrad students at IIT Kanpur, we, we design, we had kind of come up with strategies for playing this game of tic tac toe. Everybody played that game, right? And very quickly you become an expert, right? In this, uh, expert means that it is very difficult to uh, win this game and very difficult to lose this game right. Uh, most of the time it ends up in a draw, if you play it currently. So, once you play a few times, you have certain rules in your mind that this is what we have to do, but we are not telling anything to this, to this task that we are doing. So, these students have come up with strategies. Now, we are going to come up with strategies of how to play this game and they count it, it is because it is only a 9 point game. So, you can count how many strategies there can be and you think, ah, there could be 10, 20 strategies. But no, there are actually 72,657 strategies possible and these are all, there is no not one less, not one more. So, they have actually counted how many there could be, but many of them are lousy, many of them you are going to lose all the time. Okay? Um, there are few that are good. So, what we have done is that we came up with um, few of the good strategies and each of these strategies we are playing against those, okay? playing against those many times. And we are counting how many times we are winning with that strategy and how many times we are losing and how many times we are making a draw. If we are not losing, we keep those strategies aside. Then we see how many times we have won, how many times we made a draw. We have a two dimensional plot here. This point says we have probably drawn 62 times and won 
about 95 times. So, and each of these dot here is never lost. Okay, there are many, many others that are not here which have lost. So, we do not put them here. So, there is a constraint that you cannot lose. So, these are all feasible solutions that they will never lose. But there are different variations of wins and draws. So, where you should put your attention? There is a wide variety of uh, solutions here, strategies here, right? You can, you can draw most of the time and lose very few times or you can win most of the time and draw very few times. So, which is, which is your area of attention here? Over here, right? Why is that? Because you are trying to maximize the number of wins, minimize the number of draws. So, where is your Pareto optimum? This is your feasible space, feasible objective space. It is this boundary. Remember, I gave you that sketch. Maximize and minimize means over here. So, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Nine solutions we had. We throw everything away. Those nine solutions, and these are like tree diagram kind of strategies. What to do? These are common strat sorry, strategies that are laid out, and with those strategies, we are playing against those opponents. Okay. Now, this is the this would be kind of a simulation of the optimization process, two objective optimization, and finding the Pareto set. Okay. We can choose one or another one for playing the game. Okay. That could be my strategy, and I've, I can write a computer code with the strategy and throw it out on the internet, say anybody can play with it. And then I keep counting how many times I am winning, how many times others are winning. If not, I can switch to another one, because I have these nine strategies that are absolutely best in terms of win and win and draw. Okay, our goal is the innovation. So, we said, okay, now that we have done that, let us look at, is there any subtree? Is there any kind of principle that all the nine solutions have in common? That is the innovation, right? They found these three things that are there in all nine of them. And if you take any other, maybe one of these is there, two of them are there, but not all three. That is the uniqueness of this. All three of them are valid only for all of these nine solutions. Others at least do not have one. Okay? What are these strategies? This says, if the opponent is one short of winning, block it. So, this will be the situation. One short of winning, then you block it. If the center is empty, go and occupy it. That is the next that is common in all of them. If the center is filled, occupy center and edge center in this order. This is also common in all of them. And these are very common things that you may recall when you play these things. If you follow these three principles, you will win most of the time, draw, and you will never lose. You will be drawing, of course, sometimes because if you are playing against good players, they will also probably be using the same strategy, right? So in, then you will end up drawing. But this is a simple game with only finite number of possible strategies, so it is possible for us to do this. But I am trying to actually show the principle and the power of innovation of arriving at strategies that can be good for a game. So now, one thing you could do is you can try to do this for more complicated games like blackjacks or some other card playing games. But this number will touch infinity, will go towards that. So you will not be able to do the enumerative way that I have done. You need to use an optimization to first come up with optimal strategies and then look at them, all those strategies of playing the game and you can figure out what to do and then you can come up with a very good uh, game playing strategy, right? Another way, another, another way you can do this is you can come up with a game, you can design a game because game design is a big thing these days, right? Uh, and um, make sure that um, these optimal strategies do not have many common things. So, people cannot learn. Um, or as soon as they learn, you change some strategies in the game, so that this is destroyed. Uh, so, this is no more an optimal. So, this is how being a designer of the game, you can make it more and more interesting, so nobody can learn. Uh, when I was little, the Rubik cube was very difficult to do, right? Nowadays, little kids I see do it in few seconds. Okay, so, people have beaten it of how to do it. There are patterns and all that they have learned it. So, then Rubik's Cube is no more interesting. People do not buy it anymore. Okay? Um, so, if you have done it this way, you if there is a way you could have changed the design somewhat or changed the rule of the game, it can suddenly become interesting again. Right? So, designing a game, analyzing it this way and then keeping that flexibility that at, an, at some point you can go and change something in the rule and you know how is what is going to happen. You are, you are not going to have this Pareto front some of them will become now invisible, some of them will become dominated. So, new set of solutions will come out, 
and then people will wonder what to do. Because as soon as you have a game out there for a long time, what people are doing is they're playing more and more and, and actually having, they play now, they play again tomorrow, day after, and then they start to think that, ah, this was the common thing that I was doing. And this is how really you learn the pattern. So all you have to do now is break that chain. Okay. All right, I'll show you one more, which is probably very close to you. Uh, here it's 2020 cricket, which I did with one of my uh, master's degree students at IIT Kanpur. Okay, so we were trying to come up with a team. All right, so uh, it's an 11 player team, right? And there are a lot of rules for IPL, you know. There will be maximum four foreign players, one wicket keeper, and captain, and all that. So we have all those uh, as constraints. What we did is we took 129 players from the Wisden's record that they keep. And we did this in 2010, so quite a few years ago. And remember, Chennai Super, Super King was the winner that year. Okay? And um, from the database, we've got the player's batting record and bowling record. We didn't consider any kind of fielding record. I don't know whether they keep it or not. Uh, maybe they do number of catches or something. But we didn't utilize that. So of course, this is a simulation study. It should not be taken into very seriously. But what I'm trying to say is that this has implications which can be applied for team formation. So all these team owners, uh, it goes in auction, right? So you release some kind of money now, and you have to choose one player with that whole money, or it could be five players with that money. And then another round is released, and then you choose some more players, and so on and so forth, and then you finally form the team. So what we did is we uh, the, the, the evaluated team by saying, what is the bowling average, and what is the batting average? OK? We are trying to. Uh, maximize the batting average for formation of a team and minimize the bowling average for formation of the team. Both these are equally important to us. So we say, OK, since we are maximizing, we just put a minus sign, and then we are minimizing it. right? So both are minimized now. And we run NSGA2 on it, and we get lots of teams. Each circle is a team, which has 11 players in them. Okay? What I'm trying to show here is that we also took all the players of the Chennai Super King, the 11 players that played the final, and computed using our simulation, what is the bowling average and batting average, we found them here. Which means I can give you about 20, 30 different teams which would have beaten Chennai Super King that year. But of course, playing on a computer, not in the field. Because a lot of other things are important in the field, right? Um, but trying to say that what we have done is nothing bad. I mean, this is, these are good solutions. These are probably optimal okay, teams that you form. But my goal is not to show you the Pareto front. My goal is to take you now from one point to the other point and show what is common. What, what do you mean by common in teams? Is there any player common in them? So what I do is all these teams, I do a frequency of the players. You can recognize some of the players. Then you have to go back like seven years. Some of them may not be playing anymore. Um, and then um, how many times, how many teams they are appearing? So there are 100 solutions here. You can see that some of these players, which are well known, they are appearing more often than others. There are a few others that are coming down here. But importantly, there are only 29 of them over here, which means 100 other players that I have included, we have included here, do not even appear once in this Pareto optimal teams. So if I am the team owner, if I do such a study, although it's very crude, but I do the, such a study. I can actually filter it down, my choice, to 29 of them. Maybe I could do even filtering over here that it should be at least 50%, so I can get about six, seven of these players. Then I choose from there. Well, then again, the human decision maker should come in. Other factors can come in. So this can always assist them from behind and saying, here is the computer's suggestion. It could be always a suggestion. And then they can consider them or may not consider them, but they can keep it at the back of their mind. So um, team formation is a big thing in industry. Okay? For any project, they have to come up with the right team. So I was presenting them in an in a event in uh, Argentina, actually. Uh, and then Professor Siena Rao, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so he's in chemistry in ISC. Uh, he was sitting in the audience. And as I was showing this, he raised it and he said, can I use your algorithm to form my research team? Uh, he, because he always has many PhD students and postdocs. So he's actually having a team. And I thought at that point that this would be more ideal in such situations. Because 
in our labs, right, we are looking for a portfolio of some people who are good in theory, some people good in experimentation, some people good in computers, and some people good in managing stuff, writing papers. So I may have an existing people in my lab, and then I got, let's say, five applications. I can do such a study and figure out who would be the most appropriate, who is going to most fit in my, my team, so I have a better uh, two or three objective ways Pareto optimal uh, team. Uh, so I think it's more, it's very ideal over there because uh, with the resume that we get, we know what is the strength of the new person that are applying. And I know for my lab what kind of expertise I have, right? So any kind of team formation, these kind of strategies would be very good. And plus the, the filtering down of the choices that you have is very important by this process. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about innovation. Uh, Dilip, you can stay for some time or shall we do it now? Okay, so let me do another five, ten minutes, then we'll give the tea break and then that time we can do that. Okay, so this was the innovization I wanted to talk about. There are a lot of, uh, we are now doing automated innovization, which requires some machine learning methodologies applied on the multi objective data. So I'm not going there because of time. Um, yeah, there are many things I'm skipping here. What I'd like to do next is the uncertainty handling. Let me see where I have that. Um, okay. Okay, let's leave that. Okay, distributed. Um, no. Okay. Let me then finish this part and then we give a break. So I talked to you about distributed computing, right? Yesterday. Um, so one of the ways you can find the partial front is if you open up the axis for the domination check, right? Remember, we talked about briefly. So that means if I have a point here, usually anything that's on the first quadrant gets dominated by that point if you're minimizing on all of the objectives here, right? But if you open this up like this and you say this point now dominates this entire region, then you will get only a part of the Pareto front because this point dominates this part, that point dominates that part using, using the new principle. And we can systematically place them for each processor. This cone you can design systematically for different processors so that processor 1 will concentrate here, processor 2 will concentrate there, processor 3 will concentrate here, right? So we actually did that thing. There is a systematic process we talk about in the paper. But here is an example. If I have a three-dimensional Pareto front, so it's a three-objective problem, and I have two processors at my disposal, a dual core machine, for example, I can make sure that I use a cone that is going to give me Pareto optimal solutions only this, this side, and the other one gives me that side. Okay, so this is algorithmically dividing it, not hard coding and saying cut it in the middle. No, no. There is no constraint here. It's just it's the definition of domination is changed in a way that half of the region here goes to as Pareto optimal for processor 1, another half goes for processor 2. If you have 5 processors, you can split up like this. If you have 21 processors, you can split up like this. So we have a systematic procedure by which you can design these cones. I'm showing you here actual results from a 3 processor machine. Ideally, theoretically, this whole surface should be uh, obtained by 3 processors, blue, red, and green. And these are the actual results that we got from three processors. So the idea is that you got these three things, then you put them all together and declare the whole thing as a Pareto front, right? And you do it much quickly than if you're done with a single processor. Okay, I think I, I give you a break now and we will distribute. So before the break, let's distribute no, this or you want to do T and then after that, okay. Yeah, all right. Can we do some mathematical general uh, modeling for patient specific implant? Mm -hmm. Suppose I uh, have implanting of uh, human prosthetic limbs for the uh, patient. So can we generalize the optim optimized equation mathematical model by mm -hmm. which uh, we can getting the information of their coordinates data from the CT scan. Mm -hmm. We can uh, uh, we can design the uh, model 
So implant for the yeah. machine. Generally, gen generally you can. So I need some problem formulation help. Uh, yeah, problem formulation is the main thing now. So this will require maybe some biological information because every.
starts with the authority of IIT Kharagpur, then your Dean C that is a continuing education office. not have been a possibility. Okay. Now, before you start distributing the certificates, uh, we will present a small memento to Professor Dev. So, I will request you sir, please come here. <laughs> uh, 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 thank you sir. <laughs> thank you sir. And regarding the student participants, uh, we are going to refund you the money that registration fee of 1000 and uh, you will have to put your signature here, <laughs> but it is it is not for the faculty members, faculty participants, it is only for the student participant. So, what you do is you put your signature and collect 1000 rupees from us okay, along with the certificate and for the faculty participants only the certificate. Okay. <laughs> they are rich. <laughs> <laughs> they are rich. So, uh, I will request Professor Dev to distribute the, the certificates. Uh, Santanu Dutta, ha, please come here. Uh, to me, uh, to Please put your signature and collect 1000 rupees. Hi, put your signature there. Sochinanda Prasad. Please collect your money. Put your signature, collect money. <coughs> Sumit Kumar. Ah, please, please, please put your signature, collect money. A Ganesh Kumar. Hmm, please. Vishwajit Sahu. Put your signature. Devang Sumathur. And please return your feedback form, filled up feedback form. Okay, don't forget that, and give it to uh, Mr. Rao. Okay, Manjula R. Patil Amit Sanjay. Rohit Titiwal. 
रोहित रोहित टीटीवाल एब्सेंट अच्छा रोहित वाज प्रेजेंट नो इस्टरडे वाज ही प्रेजेंट हैज ही अटेंडेड हाँ अच्छा सोमरांजन जेना प्लीज टेल रोहित रोहित टीटीवाल टू मीट मी इन द ऑफिस ओके ऑन मंडे पॉजिटिवली ओके सो इज देर एनी फ्रेंड ऑफ रोहित हाँ टेल हिम टू मीट मी ऑन मंडे पॉजिटिवली इन माई ऑफिस ओके टू कलेक्ट सर्टिफिकेट एंड मनी पॉजिटिवली ही शुड मीट अदरवाइज द मनी विल गो बैक सर्टिफिकेट विल ऑल्सो गो बैक हाँ सो मंडे मॉर्निंग पॉजिटिवली ही शुड मीट मी ओके कुमार रोहित पैटेल अल्पेश कुमार पुटिय सिग्नेचर कलेक्ट मानी राजू दास बाप्पादित्य जाना शोशी वी रंग your faculty no yeah. ah, so he will not be getting any okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, obilasa panwar hmm. amit kumar bol जयराज सिंह प्लीज टेक द मनी असीम गोपाल बर्मन कुंतल माझी अखिल कुमार अतुल मालहरी चावन टेक मनी दीक्षित कुमार प्रफुल कुमार पाठक टेक मनी किरण टीपार्थी किरण ही लेफ्ट देन व्हाट विल हैपन टू द मनी एंड दिस बट मनी यू कैन नॉट टेक है
put your signature <laughs> rajesh kumar <coughs> take money roktim biswas <laughs> take money Take money. Soikot Saha. Soikot Saha. Motomotic of charge, charge, Johnny Hatchet. Oh, okay. Put your signature and collect money. Oh, okay. Satroji Dotta. Collect money. Oh, no, no, no need. Collect money. Achha, Borun Suryan. Borun. Absent. He has, he has left. Can anybody take on behalf of him? Nobody. Okay, this creates problem. No, Kinto Amaketo, we are counting to Patatagana. Tagade Pirat Pati Dita. Arjun Paul Me is okay 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 Bondada Venkat Sainath Put your signature. Kola Laxman Rao. Monajit Ray. Pranesh Pal Next is uh, Somojit Sen Put your signature. Sri Harsho Dorapudi faculty. Oh na, eglo eglo to holo na, holo na eglo reke di thabe. Acha, so ikat so thirty candidates got the money no, thirty total. 
वन टू थ्री फोर फाइव सिक्स सेवन एट नाइन टेन एलेवन टवेल्व थर्टीन फोर्टीन फिफ्टीन सिक्सटीन सेवनटीन एटीन नाइनटीन ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी वन ट्वेंटी टू ट्वेंटी थ्री ट्वेंटी फोर ट्वेंटी फाइव ट्वेंटी सिक्स ट्वेंटी सेवन ट्वेंटी एट ट्वेंटी नाइन गन्ने को लेने चाहिए एक एक है ना एक ता बोरुन एब्सेंट रहित टीटीएल एब्सेंट और क्या एब्सेंट नहीं तो ना गोना गन्ने को लेने चाहिए ठीक अच्छा तुम्हें ये था अच्छा वो था रिखे दी था अपना मार्केट ना दुजन एलो ना ये इतना ही होता है कि ना वही अपना नोट दिए पाठा था भी फिर उस पाठा था अच्छा सर्टिफिकेट तुमने सब डिस्ट्रीब्यूट हुए गए हैं सब एक ना डिस्ट्रीब्यूट हुए गए लो तो तो सर्टिफिकेट रोए था He'll be 18. Ha. Ha. Okay. You collect. You come. Come. You are from IIT Khadak, no? Ha. Please come. Come. Ha. Ha. Give this. For for Rohit Tetiwal. Take money. Ha. What's your name? कुमार रही है अच्छा ठीक है ठीक है ठीक है हम्म ठीक है अच्छा ये तो हम रख ची ये सर्टिफिकेट तो तुम्हें जस्ट बैगे रख दे हैं फोन नंबर आचे किंतु फोन नंबर के अखन पाज जावे हाँ किंतु जोधपुर थे कि तुम आज इस दर एनी बॉडी फ्रॉम जोधपुर आईटी जोधपुर एनी बॉडी एल्स हाँ हाँ ही लेफ्ट बट देर इस नोबॉडी एल्स नो ठीक अच्छे थाक देखा जावे बोल हाँ अच्छा ठीक है प्लीज कॉल एनीबॉडी नियर टू जोधपुर आईटी जोधपुर एनीबॉडी नियर टू आईटी जोधपुर 